Welcome everybody to the LFX Mentorship Showcase and we'll get started. Um, I am Shua Khan, I'm a kernel maintainer and Linux fellow at the Linux Foundation. And what do I do at Linux Foundation? I lead mentorship programs and my two passions are um, learning and sharing and empowering others to do the same. So I get to do both in my role at the Linux Foundation. So let's talk a little bit about the beginner's problem. Um, when we are trying to get into a new area, learn new technology, we are faced with the problem of where do we start? And the first step is always very difficult. Um, first of all, we have to figure out what we want to do, um, what we are passionate about, what we, if we learn something new, would be would we be able to um, something we're passionate about? So once we know that, how do we get started? The second step is always how. Um, usually, when you are learning new technology area, you, we're not confident. We are trying to figure out if where can we learn, where can we find resources to learn, and who can we ask for help. And community, usually when you want to approach the community, we feel like, well, this community is a um, uh, community of experts. It's intimidating, daunting, and code base is always looks very complex. We have at the Linux Foundation, we have resources for you to uh, explore learning pathways. Um, what do you want to learn and what can you learn in different uh, pathways like kernel or blockchain or CNCF and so on. So if you go to the Linux uh, Foundation training website, you will be able to explore uh, various pathways and then also uh, take some free courses and webinars, try out the webinars, tutorials and so on. So it kind of gives you a feel for, um, that will help you with what, and you know, hopefully you'll figure out what you're passionate about. And once you kind of figure out what, and you also can explore LF Live uh, webinar series. There are three webinar series that cover various um, technology areas, software engineering overall. And, uh, and you know, experts uh, lead interactive sessions and you can ask questions. Um, live ones happen once a month, and, but we have um, old webinars on the website. Once you know um, the area you want to pursue, you have learned a little bit, you want to, to connect with a mentor, work in a formal uh, mentoring program, you can apply to our mentorship program. This is our way to connect ex open source community experts, maintainers and experts in each of the areas with the, uh, new developers that are wanting to learn that area. So, hey, once you graduated uh, from the program, you applied, um, you learned, and once you graduate, what's next for you? This is our LFX showcase, mentorship showcase is designed to connect new graduates with people looking for talent. So we have seven graduates talking in this segment. Uh, before I hand it off to um, Aditi Ahuja, um, I would like to take a moment to um, thank our mentors. Without our mentors, we won't be able to do what we do. We won't be able to offer um, the mentorship programs. And with that, um, Aditi, you can go ahead. I will stop sharing. Hello, I'm Aditi. And um, I will be talking to you about my experience as an LFX mentee 21 at Thanos. My talk is titled, A Mentee's Foray into Thanos. Thanos is a highly available metric system with unlimited storage built on top of Prometheus. I was a Paul 21 mentee mentored by Ben Ye. I'm currently an intern at Couchbase and I'm from Bangalore, India. You can find me on these handles. My talk will be divided into two parts. 
the first, a quick overview of my work at Thanos, and the second, a bit about my mentorship experience. Let's start with why I picked Thanos and the specific project. The observability ecosystem had me intrigued for quite a while, and a mentorship with Thanos would give me the perfect head start. As a databases enthusiast, it was also an opportunity to learn more about time series databases, and hence I picked the project related to compaction of data. Familiarity with Go, the language of the code base, was an added bonus. So, now a quick detour to introduce a couple of concepts. Compaction. This is the creation of a new compacted block from one or more source blocks. The compacted block then replaces the source blocks. Some reasons for compaction are deduplicating overlapping data, mostly in adjacent blocks since this is a TSDB, so that there are no duplicate data copies and this saves disk space. Queries which, um, which require data from multiple blocks do not need to dedupe data. Downsampling. This can be understood as reducing the resolution or the density of the data or thinning out the data without reducing its accuracy. From storing a data point for every one second of time, downsample data stores a data point for every five minutes and then at the, lo at the highest resolu lowest resolution for every one hour. So, compacting a large amount of data can be time consuming and there are no metrics provided in the beginning for the user to track the progress. And the user had to manually check the UI repeatedly for an idea about the progress. Hence, to solve this, my project involved adding Prometheus metrics to show the overall status of compaction and its related processes, downsampling and retention by simulating these three. Compaction is also a multi-stage process, and it would be useful indeed to track the status and time for each step of a compaction run, which would be more fine-grained than the overall metrics. This was a stretch goal, and this was done by adding open tracing support and instrumenting the different steps, such as block planning, download, etc. Now, Onto the latter half, making the most of my mentorship. I started out knowing close to nothing about the observability ecosystem. My mentor, Ben, guided me from starting out by making toy applications to export Prometheus data to adding metrics related to compaction and downsampling, and finally working on the stretch goal that was adding tracing support for compaction. Thanks to this, Thanks to his guidance, it felt like a gradual progression, simultaneously challenging yet supportive. These are my main technical takeaways from the mentorship. Improved my Go skills. Although I did have some prior experience with Go, the mentorship polished my skills and has made me somewhat nitpicky where Go style is concerned. Learned about Prometheus and developing from Prometheus exporters for an application in Go. I also wrote a Dev.2 article about the same. I learned about tracing and instrumenting applications and the basics of working with Jaeger during the latter half of my mentorship. And finally, I improved my understanding of T distributed systems and TSDBs and Thanos compaction in specific. This was pretty fascinating since I hadn't delved deeply into these topics earlier. So, the key non-technical takeaways, just as important as the technical ones, were take initiative, start small if needed, come up with ideas or improvements for the project, and take on small issues, no matter how small. No issue is too small. My first PR was a doc change. And my first two PRs were code refactoring and changing 
an incorrect log message but they definitely boosted my confidence and familiarized me with the process don't consider time spent on a pr not merged or an idea not accepted as a sunk cost the first major pr i worked hard on was not merged since it turned out it wouldn't be needed any longer and i had spent a couple of weeks on it by then i was really looking forward to it getting merged and it did sting for a bit but then i viewed it as yet another hands on learning opportunity one of the many i received at thanos seek out feedback proactively and frequently and when you do try not to get frustrated by mistakes and lose your morale keep trying even in the face of them well this is still a work in progress for me but this was definitely one of the most important learnings tap into the community the thanos community is an amazing one like many other open source centric communities interact with and learn from them as much as you can apart from thanos specific learnings it also made me aware of newer opportunities and taught me quite a bit about software engineering in general and lastly the importance of balance or downtime this is emphasized by a lot of mentors in the community and it's only now that i'm realizing how important it is so here are some um, points to keep in mind while applying for future applicants get involved in the community as early as possible contact the mentor and understand the project this has two benefits one it helps in assessing which project is the best suited to your skills and whether a project is actually what you think about it and um, tailoring your cover letter accordingly basically show initiative keep applying don't doubt yourself i got selected only after applying the second time round and finally learn the tech stack if you don't know it already this gives you an edge thanks feel free to reach out to me with any questions or feedbacks and for a more complete account of my experience head to this dev.2 article thank you so much so my project was to develop an e2e dashboard for litmus kios so giving a brief introduction about myself uh, i am a undergraduate student at iit dhanbad currently and i was a google summer of code student with pasology and lfx menti with litmus kios and currently i am an st intern at kios native which is the parent organization of litmus kios so before moving on further to my project the main thing is what exactly is litmus kios so in very basic understanding is that litmus kios is a tool used for kios engineering now the question arises what is exactly is kios engineering so kios engineering is about testing your production environment that how uh, that whether it can withstand any turbulent conditions or not because in theory uh you assume that all your mic when you have multiple micro service architecture and all are hosted on cloud native technology like docker kubernetes then you need to be sure that there is no downtime in your uh, particular application say for example you have five copies of your server running on production and due to any fault two of the server crashes down now you can expect that the request would be uh, diverted to the rest of the three servers and the due to increase in the decrease of the number of servers the response time might increase a bit but later you would see that the two new copies of the server would automatically be created and later all everything would come back to normal and the request would be rerouted to all the five servers again but this is in theory and this should happen but in practical sometimes things don't happen as you expect and even after the new servers are created it might happen that the request is not rerouted to all the five servers and only three servers are uh, fulfilling that request so, or if an io fault occur if a network latency occurs there can be many such faults which cannot be tested by uh, a generic e2e test or end to end testing or whatever type of test you have to test your uh, cloud native architecture completely that how your different uh microservices are connected so 
the general step of any chaos engineering is first you identify what are the steady state condition by that i mean like what is the current response time server usage the load on cpu so all these conditions you see and identify then later you try to introduce a fault it can be any fault like you crash some servers or you uh, introduce some io delay or some network latency these kinds of introduce you fault you introduce a type of fault then later you try to see that are the steady state condition regained or not after some time if after some times they are regained then yes your system is resilient very good but if not then congrats you have found a weakness and now you have to resolve that particular weakness so chaos engineering is all about this and litmus chaos is uh, and one more thing about litmus chaos that just two days ago litmus chaos finally became the incubating project in Lit cncf community so earlier it was a sandbox project but two days ago it must have became an incubating project which is the next level of uh, project maturity in cncf ecosystem so moving on further about my project so next question arise why was this project required at the first place or what were the limitations of the earlier architecture that a new fresh ui was required so Earlier, the E2E dashboard was created using static HTML files. Yes, you heard it right. There were around 20, 30 HTML files which they were maintaining. So it's a good beginning like for documentation. It's completely fine to have HTML file. There's nothing uh, wrong in that. But with time, some new requirements came up. Like we have uh, our tests running daily, uh, nightly. So you need to we need to show the progress of that particular uh, test and the result of that test on our website so now things get complicated so for this they didn't remove the html file instead they created a python batch file which updated the html files daily so instead of creating a server they relied on that particular python batch script which was running daily so you can see that now when more new requirements were coming they saw that now it's getting much complex and uh, you can see that this particular architecture is not at all scalable has very limited reusability because you have 20 30 html files and all of them have the same type of theme and you cannot reuse them between different files and obviously maintaining so many numerous html files was a quite difficult and tiresome task so what they now required was a new ui in some framework like React with a fresh design and many of the new functionality which cannot be added in an HTML file and they need a, a server for them as well. So earlier we were mainly relying on the GitHub APIs for the uh, details. And in the end of any open source uh, code, we require the testing and the documentation. So these were the limitation and the project deliverables. So this is how it ended. So we created an E2E dashboard and here you can see the GitHub API results are very nicely displayed here that whether the last pipeline which ran on the GitHub was success, succeeded or failed. And we, I added even the dark theme. Then in the tab tabular format, you can see that how many pipelines failed, how many pipelines succeeded and what were the various jobs and steps of that. What was the total coverage, a description, and the most difficult part for me was to fetch the GitHub API logs because it wasn't something as straight as it might look. Because initially it was decided that uh, we just have to create a front end uh, in React and the API and the server part was just the GitHub API. But for the fetching the logs part, this came up as a new requirement. And I came to know that now I have to create a new Golang server. So I was not much familiar with Golang. It came to me as a positive surprise as I have to create a new Golang server on my own from scratch. Though the mentors were very helpful in guiding and supporting me and they provided me the good resources about that. And in the end, I, I finally created this Golang server and I learned a lot in that particular process. Mm -hmm. So next thing is what I learned from this wonderful LFX mentorship experience. I learned how to write production level React code. So there are many differences when you write your code for your personal project versus when you write for a big open source organization. Because in your personal project, you can write code 
in many a times suboptimal way or you can use any particular library of your choice but in open source whenever you are using any particular library you have to be you have to answer many things like why is that library required if it is required then is the license compatible how well the library is maintained when was the last release is it well maintained or not how good the community is so there are many things you have to keep in mind before contributing to an open source project every line you wrote you have to be sure that yes this is the best way to do it so in this particular process you learn a lot about how things are done in a big in industry or in a big open source project and, and I, as i mentioned i learned how to create a golang server i explored more about the github apis and of course a deeper understanding of tiles engineering so this was all the technical part and on the interpersonal skills i learned about verb communication like we have weekly meetings with my mentors where we discuss about the project progress and its details to ensure that there are no blockers and both of us are on the same page also it helped me to teach time management which helps in general in life as well because sometimes you have to manage your schools your studies your work and other extracurricular activities all this so it's a good lesson that you have to give time to everything and you have you should know how to manage these things you learn troubleshooting self confidence work etiquette good listener so all these things was a great learning experience so next my complete lfx journey so how it started and why i chose the litmus kios project so i was being a web developer i was interested in making my project highly scalable with zero downtime and was i was quite fascinated with cloud native technology and i wanted to learn about them and contribute to them so it was then i was exploring about the cncf projects and then i came to know about the litmus kios project that it required to create an e2e dashboard in react so it was the best project for me because i could contribute my skills to that particular project and give back to community my skills and in return i would learn a lot about kios engineering about cloud native technology how things are working at such a big scale so i learned a lot from them then i joined the slack channel the community and asked curious questions we have regular meeting monthly meetups and monthly uh, meetings of that particular organization stand ups so it was really fun discussing about those things then i created a detailed proposal with a detailed timeline and i applied and after i got selected then was the coding time where i developed the front end the golang server and then the most difficult part could be also to modify and incorporate changes by the mentors mentors were very helpful and supportive and i learned a lot through this uh, through this a pr review as well that how things are done in the production environment and a big uh, open source project they very well make me understand that how things should be done in a good way how you can improve your things it can be even small change like if you are writing one line how you can improve that one line as well and in the end i keep maintaining that project because it's not just about one time thing that you created the project you need to maintain it forever now what's next so i would keep contributing to more open source project and learning more about cloud native technology i always get fascinated and i wanted to learn more about how these cloud native technology work and how can they shape the future as they are working at a so high big scale and then help other people to make their first step in open source because i believe that the first step is generally the most hardest it is very difficult to reach from 0 to 1 than from 1 to 10 so i would like to help all the other people who are likely to take their first step so if you want to reach out to me you can reach out to me at my email my linkedin and i have also written many of my articles on medium about my open source journey and i have shared my experience there so you can go through them read them and if you have any query regarding anything you can reach out to me at my email or at my linkedin So yeah, thank you. If you have any question, you can ask. Hello everyone. Welcome to LFX Mentorship Showcase 2022. At the very outset, I would like to wish everyone a very happy new year. I am Anushka Mittal, uh, a computer science junior student from India, studying at Ramaya Institute of Technology. I worked as a LFX summer mentee with CNCF's Kubernetes. 
following which I interned with Nirmata for about four months, uh, working on the development of Kiverno. Apart from loving technology, I absolutely enjoy dance and dramatics. Today, I will be presenting the making of Falco adapter. So let's dive in. A quick look into the problem. Kubernetes Policy Working Group has created and defined a policy report CRD. The use of this is to basically unify, uh, you know, the. it's basically to study and investigate the outputs provided by various policy engines and to unify them, to use them as Kubernetes resource. This will help cluster admins manage cluster uh, by, you know, using any Kubernetes management tool like kubectl. So the scope of the project was to build a tool that would run Falco in any Kubernetes cluster and then generate and update periodically a report from the Falco alerts received. The, so there were many steps involved, many phases, and every day was a new journey to answer different questions. But the major three steps involved were the following. One, gRPC output versus HTTP output. So we had to decide how we would get uh, output from Falco, the Falco alerts to our adapter. We uh, researched and compared the options uh, that were output via gRPC client versus uh, HTTP output via Falco Sidekick. We finally decided that the easiest and best way to go about would be HTTP output via Falco Sidekick. And we decided we would integrate our adapter as an output for Falco Sidekick. The second very important step for us was mapping the information received, received uh, via Falco alerts, via Falco Sidekick, to the fields defined in policy report CRD. And this had to be done in a very meaningful manner. This was finally done uh, with discussion, with a lot of discussion and uh, approval from the folks in working group policy. The last important step in my project was generating reports uh, with optimized configuration options. So once we were able to generate a normal single report, we wanted to make sure that we address, uh, you know, the customizations a user would want, uh, the number of um, various reports, namespace specific versus cluster specific reports. And we wanted to make sure that we don't run into problems when there's a huge cluster with multiple Falco sidekicks running. So in, in the project during the entire three months, we researched, we worked on and implemented uh, all these uh, steps and we had a final result. So I have made a very short video of what it looked like finally uh, in the development environment on my local system to just give you an idea of how the policy report looks like. That's good. So now that we know what my project was and what I built, let's look into what I learned over the three months. Honestly, I learned a lot of things. There were so many things, new things that I learned, some old things that I defined, but the major three things that I want to cover today, highlight today are uh, my Golang and GitHub learning. I learned a new language uh, just a month before the project and uh, applied it and of course gained an in-depth knowledge over the three months of the internship. And I'm really happy that happened and I'm really happy for, uh, that LFX mentorship for providing this platform because uh, I use Golang to date. I was able to understand code base, write my code, production level code and tests in Golang. I extensively used GitHub and learned most of it during this uh, three months and made my first big project. The second thing, that I want to highlight is my the knowledge I gained about policy engines, CRDs, and CNCF technologies. Uh, well, I I studied using doc documentation available online resources, use Kubernetes, Falco, Falco Psychic on my local system, and learned a lot about them. I also learned about policy engines while working with Falco and uh, about CRDs and how powerful they make a Kubernetes. And finally, I cannot emphasize enough on how much of personal growth I saw in these three months. I was able to deal with presentation anxiety, which was a big deal for me back then. And uh, well, I did well. <laughs> and uh, I worked with a team all across the globe and uh, built a project from scratch to what it is. I met deadlines. I 
you know, came across unexpected roadblocks, addressed them, took responsibility. And this was truly an incredible experience. And I owe it all to the LFX team for this, well, platform, to my mentor and the entire community. Here, I would like to take a minute and express my gratitude to my mentor, Jim Bagwadia. He is a co-founder and CEO of Nirmata and the co-chair of Policy Working Group. He is overall, above all of this, an awesome person. And uh, we used to connect uh, almost every day via Slack weekly on Zoom and discuss the project. I could always bank on him to help me, guide me, and you know, just um, be there. And he was always willing and ready to help. So grateful for that. He was very supportive too through all personal issues and uh, did not miss any opportunity to provide very relevant career guidance. I'm very grateful for my mentor. And uh, a special thanks also goes to Thomas from Falco. He is a creator of Falco Sidekick and he worked with me through each step. He made it very easy for me to contribute to Falco Sidekick and build my project to what it is. He used to sync with me, correct my mistakes, review my PRs, and uh, it was just a great experience. It wasn't really just a three player game. It was the entire community. Uh, I worked, I remember having open uh, conversations about questions, I've, uh, doubts I was facing on Slack channels for weeks. Everyone just pitching and putting in what they think about the issue. And uh, multiple, um, multiple people in community meetings telling me that, you know, maybe this is the direction I should also look at and uh, posing some very relevant questions to address, which helped me really refine my project and bring it to the very step it is at now. So I think this was one uh, of the surprises that came along out of this mentorship the community experience. I am so very grateful for the community experience that LFX mentorship and just Kubernetes community has created. And I'm, uh, the Kubernetes is one of the, uh, one of the communities that I have been actively a part of and I wish to explore more, but uh, I work with so many people, learned from them, got inspiration from them, became a better person and an open source developer because of them. Very grateful for that. The second thing, Second surprise was self-awareness for me. Working with Falco and later with Kiverno, uh, getting introduced to SIG security, I really realized my passion for security and how my interests lie in that domain. I hope to take that forward from here. And finally, the growth and opportunities. LFX mentorship opened a lot of opportunities for me, uh, some of which were speaking at KubeCon uh, North America 21. Uh, in a panel and interacting with people at that level and being able to uh, just have that presence in the community. Uh, the second was my internship that came uh, out of this mentorship itself with at Nirmata and many more. This makes me answer the question, uh, what's next? LFX opened an ocean of opportunities and I wish to explore more and more in open source communities over the coming years. And I hope to increase my open source involvement in security domains, especially. Open source involvement for me does not just mean coding contributions. Uh, it's non-coding contributions, interacting with new people, being active on Slack and being able to contribute in any and every way I can. Uh, being in my pre-final year, I am constantly looking out for internship and research oppor opportunities to upskill myself, to learn, work and contribute. And in future, I wish to work in places and organizations where I could make a key difference as an engineer in important projects. With that, I have come to an end, but uh, here are some of, my, uh, some of my handles that you can reach out to me. Uh, do you know, just discuss technical or non-technical stuff. That would be really great. Uh, if you want to know a little more about my work, I have, uh, I have prepared a really detailed a uh, blog on everything that happened during the three months, more technical. And uh, yes, you can definitely check it out. And there's also a link to my uh, PR, my work in Falco Sidekick. Finally, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, LFX team, for this opportunity. And that's me signing off. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Linux Foundation Mentorship showcase. I'm Marsh and this session is going to be about how we evaluate dependency updates in the upstream Kubernetes project. 
which is what I worked on during my Linux Foundation mentorship. So let's get started. Uh, bef before we begin, I want to give a brief overview of what I'll be covering in this talk. So I want to keep this session very beginner friendly. So without assuming any prior knowledge, we'll start by a brief intro into what event dependencies are, how Go handles them, and why you should care about your project dependencies in the first place. Then I'll introduce you to Depstat, which is the command line tool I created during my mentorship project, and we use it in the upstream Kubernetes project to analyze dependencies. I'll go over all the subcommands it offers, and then we'll see how exactly we integrated it with the Kubernetes project. In the end, I'll touch on how I got the opportunity to work on this project, and I'll go over some other mentorship opportunities available if you are looking to contribute to Kubernetes. So. First things first, what exactly are dependencies? Well, dependencies put simply are external packages which your code uses. These external packages are distributed as modules. As per the definition of a module in Go, it is nothing but a directory containing uh, nested and related Go packages with a go.mod file at its root. If you aren't familiar with uh, what a go.mod file is, don't worry, I wasn't before the mentorship and I'll be covering what it is in the next few slides. So for example, you can see here that we make HTTP requests in our code, and we are using this very common module called Julian Schmidt HTTP router, which then ends up being a dependency of our project. So if you look closely, there are other packages and modules we are importing to like log FMT, uh, but these are internal to Go, so we don't consider them as dependencies of our project. So once you put your code in its own module, you'll see that a code.mod file appears in your project directory. A go.mod file simply describes the module's properties, including its dependencies on other modules of Go and on versions of Go. So when you add dependencies, Go also creates a go.sum file that contains the checksums of the modules you depend on. Go uses this to verify the integrity of the downloaded modules. Please note, however, that the go.sum file is auto-generated and, and you should never have to edit it manually. To keep your managed dependency set tidy, you can use the go mod tidy command. Using the set of packages imported in your code, this command edits your go.mod file to add modules that are necessary but missing. It also removes unused modules that don't provide any relevant packages. And lastly, it will regenerate the go.sum file based on your go.mod file. Super technical, but long story short, if you stop using the package example.com, this module, then you run go.mod go mod tidy, it'll just remove this package from the go.mod file. So why should you even care dependencies, right? You know what they are and how Go handles them, but why did we need a tool and all that stuff? So the thing is that sooner or later, you would have to update the dependencies of your project. Uh, you would have to update the dependencies of your project. This might be because you want the changes in the latest release of that dependency, but let's say even if you're satisfied with the current features, you might have to update it because of a security vulnerability found in the older releases, which got fixed in a newer one. And updating dependencies brings with it a whole set of headaches. You'll have to make sure that it doesn't break the current code and that it is compatible with existing dependencies you are already using. So I think when it comes to dependencies, it is safe to say the lesser, the better. Now, this does not mean that you should try implementing the functionality of each external package on your own, no. The reason I say that lesser dependencies are better because that means you'll have to keep track of fewer releases for your project dependencies and you would have a much easier time updating them. All of this might seem trivial for a small project and frankly it is, and you could get away with not caring at all about dependencies. But when a project grows to the size of Kubernetes, all of this becomes very important. Updating dependencies could often mean breaking stuff and skipping a crucial dependency update could mean exposing a lot of users to a security risk. So long story short, the simpler the dependency chains are, the better. Being particular about your project dependencies right from the start and tracking them is extremely helpful in the long run. It was to solve all these problems that we created the command line tool called Depstar during my uh, mentorship. So before we before I tell you what Depstar does, let me 
uh, tell you how it is important before you start working on a project, which I learned to first analyze the problem you're trying to solve. I would say this is one of the major key learnings which came out of the mentorship. It was to stop looking at fixing things or how we are fixing this and taking a step back and asking why. Why are we fixing this? What do we need out of this? So we knew we needed something to analyze dependencies, but what should this thing do? The biggest problem we wanted to solve, we realized was that the Kubernetes repository was receiving so many pull requests and it was getting tough to notice which one of these were changing dependencies. Not only that, but how are these dependencies changing and what was the impact of these changes? We also wanted there to be a way where PR, PR authors can themselves see the impact of their dependency changes without one of the maintainers having to ping them. And to solve all of this, once we knew what we needed, we created with, uh, we came up with the command line tool. So Debstat is a command line tool for analyzing the dependencies of Go modules enabled projects. You can install it by running go install, github.com, Kubernetes, whatever the URL is, or by grabbing the latest binaries from the Debstart repository. So it provides us with four command, sub commands and the commands are stats, graph, cycles, and list. Stats would give you uh, statistics related to your dependencies, which I'll show in our next slide. Uh, the graph sub command creates a graph of all the project dependencies you have, which is useful to visualize how your dependencies look and track the paths uh, and help you to figure out where a security vulnerability might lie. Cycles basically shows how many cycles you have in dependencies and cycles in dependencies are something you should try to avoid. So cycles in dependencies are if your project depends on A and then dependency A depends on B and then B again depends on A. So you have a cycle in your dependency. And list is a simple command which just simply lists your project dependencies. So now that you know what DevSat does, let me go over how we use it in the upstream project. DevSat runs as a prow job and prow is nothing but a Kubernetes based CI CD system. So for DevSat, we have two prow jobs. One is a periodic job, which runs every six hours on the master branch of KK. KK is short for the Kubernetes repository. We also have a pre-summit prow job, which runs automatically on pull requests, which change the go.mod, go.sum file, or any of the files in the vendor directory. So uh, this can also be triggered manually on PRs by commenting uh, forward slash test check dependency stats, and that's thanks to Prow. What this job does is run Debstat on the code, which is present in the PR, and then print its difference with the output of running Debstat on the master branch of Kubernetes. This way we can figure out the uh, changes in dependencies if we merge a particular PR. So uh, Debsat produces an output which would look like this every six hours. And this is what the stat command does. It gives you uh, these four crucial statistics. And if your PR changes dependencies, if your PR to the Kubernetes project uh, changes dependencies, Prow would catch that and run the job I just mentioned. So if you see here that it tells you that the number of dependencies uh, being changed is one, which is reported thanks to Debstat. So uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on, which came out of this mentorship was that I learned, I, I got a sense of how, how good it feels when you actually see a project you created being used in the community, being used by people. And that is a very fulfilling feeling. And I feel that comes through open source. And this is one of the reasons I feel everyone should contribute to open source. And uh, I, I got the opportunity to be mentored by Dames, who most people involved in Kubernetes would know. Going from almost no prior knowledge, I learned a lot while working on this project. My only advice would be that if you're applying to these mentorships, please don't self-reject thinking that you don't know enough because all of us are always learning all the time and don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, I've listed some other mentorship opportunities available here. So personally, I've been a part of almost all of these, and I can say that these have helped me grow and learn a lot. You can also learn more about such opportunities by visiting the link in the URL. And lastly, if you have any questions or want to reach out to me, you'll find all my social handles there. Once again, thank you so much for attending, and I hope you learned something new from this session. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, I am Dev Brata, and here's my talk on AWS Kiosk, uh, empowering resiliency through Kiosk engineering. 
A bit about me. Uh, I am uh, Deva Brata. Uh, I major in biomedical engineering, uh, basically in my final year. Uh, so uh, over the years, I have uh, developed interest in open source technologies and been passionate about cloud native technology, and that's the reason I've applied uh, to this mentorship program. An overview. Uh, so the organization that I uh, mentored with was uh, Kiosmes. Uh, Kiosmes is a cloud native kiosk engineering platform. Uh, with powerful chaos toolkits and a friendly interface uh, to use and program. So uh, basically, uh, before uh, starting, I would uh, like you to know about what is chaos engineering. Basically, uh, chaos engineering is for uh, the microservices-based architecture where you could inject fault into your systems uh, and uh, you could get an observability based on that, like uh, how the fault is affecting your system, uh, how your system is resilient to those faults. And what's more important about uh, chaos testing is it, it happens in the production. Uh, so you have to define a specific boundary that uh, which specific nodes or which specific uh, machines or instances uh, you need to get affected by these tests. Uh, and uh, this is quite helpful uh, to uh, estimate uh, the vulnerabilities in your system. Uh, so basically my mentorship topic uh, revolved around uh, enriching the already present AWS kiosk in the kiosk mess environment. So kiosk mess supports various types of kiosks like network kiosk, input output kiosk, stress kiosk. So uh, the, the first words of this like AWS network or input output define on which the kiosk is applied. For example, in this AWS kiosk, we try to inject fault into AWS ecosystems like the EC2 instances. Uh, so basically uh, the earlier kiosk was uh, limited to only EC2 start and stop. So that was also not structured and stable. So the, the ma major part was to make it more structured and stable with the already implemented AWS kiosk. And also to uh, you know, implement the complete service failure in AWS. So that might be useful for testing infrastructure automation tools. So what I learned. So basically before starting uh, with this mentorship program, uh, I, I didn't have much idea about Kubernetes or the orchestration tool. However, uh, I knew about container technology. So I had to start with, you know, what are pods, what are replica sets and daemon sets. And basically with this daemon sets, since uh, these are uh, what uh, the whole, uh, you know, chaos mess is based on, uh, the config maps and daemon sets, those are heavily used uh, to implement any chaos. Uh, so I learned about those. And then uh, try to deploy the workloads, some of the workloads on my own machine. Like you could uh, see, see this, go through this link. It is basically the hello world for Kubernetes. And then uh, I uh, jumped into uh, Chaos Mess as an end user. I started using it and then uh, followed this development guide to you know start uh, building my own Chaos. Uh, so I I was pretty much successful in that. And then I started with you know. Uh, um, taking up some issues like some good first issues like this updating the make file was some some of some around a good first issue and then uh i tried to implement this kios target support for uh, more than one container to get habituated with the large code base of the project and uh, you know set up my local system for writing optimized codes so what i learned so basically uh the whole project the whole project required me to write my own custom controllers which could generate config maps and uh, that would that would be injected into a pod, and then uh, that would act as a uh, definition for the chaos that is to be implemented in AWS chaos. So this whole thing is built upon one concept called Kubernetes operator pattern. I learned about that, uh, as I said, wrote about my own custom controllers. So these controllers were chaos controllers, and we need to uh, change the routers according to it uh, so that it, it connects with the Kubernetes controller properly. And also we have, we need to uh, manage the dashboard, like what needs to be showcased in the dashboards. And uh, the chaos control manager was already present. We didn't need to uh, touch it. And the chaos daemon, obviously we needed to uh, also do some changes to the chaos demand the executive component part so as you could see in the diagram uh when an end user interacts uh, with chaos mess uh, there, are, there are three types of part like you could interact with the dashboard you could use using client.apply or kubectl apply then there is this kubernetes api server which interacts with the chaos controller manager uh, which was the important part of every chaos we write like uh, this controller manager uh, needs to be properly defined uh and it, it the the timings and the blast radius which we define in chaos uh, chaos testings need to be defined by this chaos controller manager and then 
it uh, it sends signals to kiosk daemon or kubelets which has its own process ids uh, and then it goes to the container runtime and this containers uh, and the kiosk is injected by this kiosk daemon uh, to this container directly or as a sidecar uh, through uh, this kubelet uh, uh, api so uh, uh, as you see my work was to create the custom controllers and to generate the crds which would define my uh, kiosk experiment so let's go through what how we started so basically the idea initial idea was required to implement only one type of aws kiosk as part of the project like it was easy to start and stop we could have injected like ec2 network stop network uh, like uh, implementing kiosk in network but when i started more about uh, what are the present uh, uh, features that is available to implement kiosk engineering in aws ecosystem i found something called aws system kiosk runner uh, and there were a lot of functionalities that was already available with uh, aws system kiosk runner so instead of uh, creating our own uh, config maps for each of the kiosk uh, separately uh, we thought of why not uh, integrate this whole thing with the uh, kiosk mesh so that uh, once you inject a uh, kiosk like you could uh, define your kiosk experiment through uh, kiosk controllers and uh, you could uh, observe the uh, the kiosk the fault injection through the kiosk dashboard so we planned it in two parts first part would be a uh, runner thing uh, which would integrate uh, which integrates with aws system kiosk runner and that part needs to be written in kotlin and the cli uh, to be written in the kotlin and a docker image to be built out of it so another part was as i said writing the kiosk controller which would define aws kiosk and it is to be written in go and a controller of aws kiosk will uh, create an pod with that uh, kotlin cli image and send commands to aws so basically uh, what uh, is required is the cli requires you to write the definition of kiosk as a json file and uh, we could create it uh, with config map and then mount it into the pod to provide the json file but uh, the the uh, real issue that arise was afterwards after we were able to create the cli uh, the cli reference we used in the controller uh, and the config map was mounted in the pod when we tried to test it in local stack so local stack is basically uh, basically you could say a tool uh, to you know um, simulate the aws environments uh, there were you know date time format errors that were inconsistent and it is very important kiosk engineering so we needed to you know uh, again uh, put a pr in the local stack repo and uh, do an upstream post from ourselves to uh, mitigate that issue and then yeah, then uh, this thing worked properly and uh, you know this aws kiosk could be implemented so the surprise the biggest surprise that came to me in this whole uh, project was i was uh, you know contributing to a large project uh, with a lot of people already involved in it and a lot of uh, directories uh, and a lot of changes that happen every day so when we tried to uh, implement this multi container support uh, for kiosk mess under stress kiosk uh, we did a lot of changes and that nearly took me around 15 20 days uh, to go through everything and do the changes but unfortunately we couldn't merge this pr and the only reason was that it it was breaking existing code bases and the reason this happened was we didn't discuss it with the community early on uh, and uh, didn't raise an rfc so basically there is a pipeline of how to imp implement a feature in uh, kiosmes so there is something called kiosmes less rfc you have to uh, first propose your idea there and then uh, you know start contributing so uh, as i was just experimenting with stops and as i stated to my mentor my mentor was like yeah you could go ahead with that so yes uh, this this was a learning for me like you know uh, whenever you try to uh, implement something you try to uh, add a feature uh, in a large feature uh, to to the code base you need to discuss it with the community in the uh, pipeline that is already available and after that it prompted me to go through all the documentation that is available uh, for the kiosk mess and yeah uh, that's this this was a learning lesson for me and my mentoring experience obviously uh, zao was a great mentor uh, like uh, we had we had a little bit of uh, problems while communicating because uh, of the language barriers but he being a very skilled developer uh, he used to understand the problems that i used to uh, ask to him and uh, you know basically uh, more than learning and implementing kiosmes which is very technically advanced uh, he he encouraged me to experiment with stubs and you know uh, to learn the basics the basics of how these things work and uh, very patient uh, he was very patient while clearing my doubts and the only way of communication we fixed was the slack so i used to uh, send him any problems or any of the 
hiccups i had and he used to clear it uh, in the slack itself and then he made sure my development environment was highly optimized you know because the code we uh, wrote uh, needs to be uh, merged in large code bases and it won't be buggy and it should be understood by other people using it so he also even helped me to set up my ide earlier i was using vs code i didn't even knew uh, the existence of goland and uh, the capabilities of goland as an ide uh, so yes so uh, he helped me with that and uh, that was an amazing experience so yes finally i graduated after 3 months and what now so now i have given multiple talks about the work i did uh, during my mentorship and uh, after my mentorship i was really inspired by what is you know uh, uh, kubernetes and i i, I didn't even knew like you know uh, the vastness of kubernetes so i started contributing to upstream kubernetes and i now work actively with sicontrivex i'm a shadow in the release team also a maintainer of contributor catacoda which hosts uh, uh, you know uh, uh the tutorials to help uh, upstream developers who are new to the community and yeah i enjoy a lot contributing to open source communities and basically the community and the learning i have is very very fast and i could say uh, i have upskilled uh, my the, the upskilling has been quite exponential when i'm involved with the community and you know how a uh, project is uh, starting from scratch to end like if a feature is implemented how it is implemented and that's a great learning experience for me working in this large projects so yeah thank you that's from that's all from me as a mentor uh, so if you have any question you could reach out to me uh, in slack or in our twitter or any handles i have uploaded my presentation as a skid you could go through that in the necessary links are available thank you uh, let me uh, begin by first of all welcoming everyone who has joined today so thank you so much everyone for joining the lfx mentorship showcase and uh, So as we move ahead let me just uh, first of all tell you what are we going to talk about so today we are going to talk about we are actually going to dive into we are actually going to dive into kubebench policy report adapter and what is this this is the summary of my spring mentorship experience spring mentorship experience with lfx and uh, let's move on to introduction so talking about myself so i uh, uh, as it has been written here that sometimes i'm a poet sometimes i code um, so this also was a little poetic attempt to introduce myself that titles all these titles that we are and they come and go spring lfx men 2021 i was upcoming intern at the mata i am and now in order to you know that that dilemma or that internal rife between the title the ultimate title that we have is i it comes and goes with us after that what remains so that is what i wish to talk about here that for as long as i remains shall i remain so that was a little you know a poetic side but now we are going move we are moving again back to the technical side and before we move to the technical side uh, something that i haven't mentioned in the slides but uh, because it i just got reminded of that i would like to tell about that story like how i got introduced to this program so shua is here today with us so it was open source summit in lyon uh, it happened in 2019 you know those pre covid era times what wonderful times they were so so, so uh, it was then when i was introduced to this program and i still remember that talk that shua gave to introduce us to this program which was then known as community bridge mentorship program and at that time i was interested in linux kernel as well so i applied like three or four times to this program and this was i guess my fourth time when i finally got selected uh, it was almost thrice uh, i was redirected i would not like to call it rejection because almost all rejections are redirections so now moving to next what we did what happened here now what 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 we were trying to solve in this mentorship we are going to talk about that so first of all thank you so much shua again and thank you so much everyone who's listening uh, i also hope that you and your family is safe in this pandemic everyone what are we going to solve what what did we solve actually so as a fellow mentee uh, uh, anushka just mentioned that she was also a part of kubernetes working group policy and what what the policy working group has been doing it it has been you know uh, it, it has been defining it is it has defined a policy report custom resource definition and what 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 is the purpose the purpose is to help you know it become a unification of all the outputs from the multiple policy engines so they can be multiple policy engines like she worked on palco uh, i worked on kubebench and there are many other examples like kubearmor another mentee who worked on that so what was my task so my task was to build a policy report adapter 
for Cubebench. And what does Cubebench does? So Cubebench basically runs CIS benchmark checks. Uh, and, uh, and what we wanted was we wanted to produce a policy report and we wanted that policy report to run in a cron job. So cron job is basically to run it in a scheduled way. Okay, so and how did we solve this? How, 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 how we started implementing it, right? So like every step was incremental. And the first major challenge that came to me that was or came to us was basically creating the client code for CRD. And it was like, so once created, it can be used by even all other adopters as well. So, uh, so it was one of the biggest challenges that I faced earlier because I had little experience with Golang. I was very new with Golang. I was very go new with the libraries that were creating, helping create client code, even new with the, the concept called CRD. But as the mentorship goes, rolled out, it was an amazing experience. The first part was done. The next step was another interesting step of mapping uh, because, you know, the policy report custom resource definition will have certain variables. The cube bench will be giving a particular output. We have to map both the structures. We would have we have to map both the structures. So that was done in the second step. The third part was wiring it all. You know, just uh, we, 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 how to line up all the things, how to make things work. And finally it worked. But how did it work? I would love to show a demo. So I'll be stopping the screen share just for a moment to share it again. The, uh, the video is just a 30 second video where I will be uh, just uh, showcasing what will be happening. So just, just give me a moment. Uh, yeah, so I'm sharing the screen again. Uh, let me just go to Zoom. Really sorry for this inconvenience, yeah. Okay, I hope uh, this is visible. So, so what we are going to do in the first step <clears throat> is we are going to, uh, let me just move for a few seconds back. Yeah. So, I guess, yeah, okay, so let's move ahead. So the first step uh, was to create or define the CI. Uh, that happened in the first step. The next step was to create the RBACs. And this is actually a, a all built project. The project has already been built. So as you can see, the first step was the policy report creation. After that, we created the RBACs, which actually help, uh, which would help the cron job to run the pods behind the scenes. So cron job was running there and it ran the uh, job. And here, as we will now see that we will, we will be able to see the cluster policy reports here. So we can see the cluster policy reports here of the cube bench, 69 pass, 11 fail. So, uh, that is how the project uh, runs now, and its documentation can be found in the Kubernetes Working Group Policy Repository. So, going back to the slides, so let's, let me uh, share the screen back so that we can come back to slides again. So, yeah. So, after the demo, let's move to the next part. Yeah. What was my experience and how this project actually shaped up? This project would not have been in its present form if I did not have the tremendous support of my community as well as my mentor, Jim Bhagwati. So if I have to talk about Jim, I can tell you that even today he supported me. Uh, I would like to share that my family was reported COVID positive yesterday, yesterday and I was a little nervous in the morning. And uh, thankfully I'm in hostel, my family is in another town, but uh, yeah, almost all of them are COVID positive. They are uh, getting treated and they are being treated well. But I spoke to my mentor, Jim, again, and he helped me to reinstate that confidence in me to boost me up to see if I have present, if I've been able to make up the slides in any way. Uh, and uh, that that speaks a lot about him. And the uh, when we come back to the experience of this mentorship, daily meetings, or no, daily async meetings, not sync, of course, uh, like I used to update him daily on Slack. I used to ping him daily on Slack. I used to annoy him daily on Slack and he used to reply me daily, almost all the blockers, all the doubts that I had. And and he was a mentor who, who and he's a mentor who, who makes you intuitively learn. It's not that he will direct you or give you a roadmap. He will make you learn by your own. And that is one of the best quality a mentor can have. And we had bi-weekly community meetings where I used to share our progress. And then post this project also, I continued my involvement with the community, help fellow mentees like Anushka and uh, Stephen. Uh, along with that, I was a mentee myself in spring. 
and thanks to Jim and thanks to this country that I became a mentor along with Jim and uh, had the opportunity to mentor Hardik, who built a Cuba Armor Policy Reporter after. And it was, and he also graduated recently, and it was really an amazing experience from being a mentee to a mentor in just few months. So that is what this community does to us. And to the folks who, are, who want to know what I learned, I learned a lot of things, to be honest. But uh, a broad category of people who, who start with Kubernetes usually feel that it's a very huge project to start with. So I, I've shared in this, this slide a thread of a thread by Tim's, which actually helped me start also. So this was the thread which helped me begin. And other than that, what we learned was about CRD, the various policy reports, the output engines, the client Go and core generator, in fact, Golang itself. Uh, I learned and in fact gave a talk also on Golang for introducing Golang to Q in KubeCon North America, which I'm going to talk a little about. Other than technical things, this mentorship helped me become more empathetic, more kind, and more humble and more grounded. What surprises it brought for me? So the first surprise that it brought for me was that it happened through our Twitter communication only uh, when Priyanka Sharma tweeted that she wants to know a story, a great story. And I replied to her and what happened after that was, you know, one of the most watershed moments of my life that, uh, we, that I became a guest speaker with her at KubeCon Europe. And other than that, I presented two talks at KubeCon North America as well. One was talk was to about a, a panel discussion of introducing open source to students, and the other was about deciphering Golang for students again. And other than that, the internship opportunities at HackerRank or even Nirmata, and many other offers from other cloud native companies came because of this mentorship. And there were some other amazing connections that I built for life with that are built for life now, for especially the friends. So that 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 was my learning, my experience. And now if you wish to connect with me, you can connect with me on Twitter. And I would like to thank you everyone for joining. Thank you so much. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, connect with you all and learning from all of you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. So hello everyone, I'm Sachin and I'm here to present my talk on, it will be a pretty chill talk. I will be going into a bit technical details, but it will be kind of like what my mentorship was like and how one can learn from my experience and the experience of others. So the title is like a bit lit bit, you know, but I promise it's not as uh, cringy as, as it sounds. Uh, so like start, uh, I'll start with who I am. So you can see a good photo of me. Uh, you can also see him at the back. We are at the offices of HackerRank during our intern offsite. It was cool. Uh, so I just completed my internship at HackerRank. I'm a final year undergraduate. Uh, and I was a LFX Spring mentee in Spring 2021 uh, last year. So how uh, so my uh, experience with Kubernetes and this cloud native ecosystem is um, I started with Kubernetes uh, as Mitunji say, uh, Dim's thread and uh, interaction with him helped a lot to get me into this. And uh, I learned a lot about how different components works on my own, just a high level overview before diving into code. And then the community helps you along. Uh, if you want to find something, you just have to ask in the Slack channel or just reach out to someone and they will gratefully help you out with that stuff. So that is how I got into it. Then I, along the way somewhere, I found about uh, what Spiffy Spire is and what LFX mentorship is. And so uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about what this Spiffy inspired, and what these two terms are, what the new health system is, which I added uh, during my Linux Foundation mentorship, and what I learned about uh, learning from mistakes, which is kind of uh, known, but uh, you know, there's a difference between realization and understanding. When you uh, realize it, uh, that's when you truly get it. Uh, understanding is uh, just knowing the stuff. So I'll talk a bit about that and what you can uh, learn about this, uh, learn about my experience. And if you have any, you want to know more about the projects, uh, you can just go on to spiffy.io. These documentations are great. Uh, I really appreciate the documentations and the formatting and all of that. So what is the, what was the problem that we had initially? So in uh, distributed systems, we have a large number of services. You know, services come online, they go offline, uh, they talk to each other and all that. And so how do we know um, what services are authentic? I mean, how do we authenticate all these services, right? There are huge number of services um, and we cannot just track every services and give them an ID and track uh, and just assign them a certificate to you know talk to each other. 
So authentication is the main problem that if your fire deals with. Uh, how we deal with, we uh, uh, I will get, in a, get into it in a bit. But this is the main problem that if you inspire, uh, are, have find a solution, kind of need solution it. And uh, uh, we'll see. So Spiffy is secure production identity framework for everyone. It's a long term, but what it essentially does, are, these are essentially, Spiffy is just a, a, a set of specifications rather than uh, proper implementation. So when you go to GitHub slash Spiffy slash, uh, slash Spiffy, you will see a lot of markdown files and these have all these uh, set of specifications that a system needs to uh, have in order to be Spiffy compliant. So uh, Spire is just an implementation of Spiffy, but it's not the only one. If you go to uh, go on to the documentation, you'll find there are more to these. But uh, yeah, essentially uh, what Spiffy does, it will provide uh, authentication methods to every workload, every services uh, in, the distributed, uh, in the distributed system. Um, so Spire. Spire is the implementation of the real-time implementation of Spiffy. It is created by the maintainers and developers of Spire. It is a uh, platform agnostic and heterogeneous. Uh, I should have mentioned heterogeneous, but what it does is like, you don't have to worry if uh, you know some services are deployed on AWS or some services are deployed on uh, Google Cloud. What it does is it will give everyone a way to authenticate each other. And the way it does is like uh, whenever a system, so Spiffy has two parts, Spire has two parts. It has a service, uh, it has a uh, agent, and it has a server. Uh, so the agents are like they sit, uh, yeah, they sit in the sidecar of all these services, and they uh, interact with the server. When uh, in, during the interaction, uh, they demand for certain certificates, uh, and there's two ways to do that. Uh, uh, first of all, it authenticates the workload itself, uh, and uh, doing something called uh, node attestation. And uh, sorry, workload attestation, and then uh, there's something called node attestation in which it um, authenticates the environment itself. Like if it's in AWS, it will ask for all these documentation uh, from AWS and send it to a uh, server. So the server will uh, also do its authentication and all, and create an SWIT, uh, Spiffy Verification Identity Document. Uh, and it will send it to Spire and all the uh, to uh, it, uh, in the agent, and it, agent will have all these certificates with itself, which it can provide to the workload whenever they demand for it. And these uh, and using these certificates, they can interact with other workloads and authenticate themselves. Uh, so, my project was to implement the new health system, and for that we have to know what old subsystem was like. So earlier we use uh, like Go Health. It's a library, a very pretty neat library to make to make health calls and get the responses. Um, uh, but it was pretty simple uh, for a project so complex. What it did was for if I have to check if a project is live, I'll do a HTTP 200 uh, to it, so it will know okay now it's live. The workloads are live, and for ready next checks, we just uh, saw that the server was able to fetch. Uh, uh, fetch the bundles uh, for the readiness checks, but it was pretty rudimentary. But because there are a lot of parts, there are a lot of internal working parts in Spire itself, and it, these simple tests would not have sufficed in the long term. So for the new system, we decided to have a global namespace check. Um, sorry, just for a second, I have to switch back to the screen to see if there's something. Um, all right, okay. Wait, sorry, sorry about that. Oh, okay. So uh, for the new system, we have to check uh, the all these components. So Spire has like a certification authority, a data store, a manager, and all these have different uh, workings. And we cannot just ping these and find like, okay, this, this is working or this is not working. So we what we decided is to accumulate, give, give them some tasks and accumulate the result of those tasks and divide it into readiness and liveliness of the system and check out if, uh, and take all these results and check if globally it works or not, uh, Spire as a whole system works or not. So for example, that we have CA manager, cat uh, catalog manager, and um, all these systems. There are more systems, there are just some systems that I worked on, but there are more systems to this we can, which we can apply the health checks on. So for a little example, like uh, let's say we have to check the health for CA. 
what we uh, what we'll do we'll give a see a small task like it to mint an x509 x uh, s fit if it mints it uh, we have like okay it is now both ready and uh, it is uh, it can go live also so and similarly for manager catalog we can see its ability to store these um, these uh, s widths in itself and check uh, okay, if it's if it can do these tasks, then it's also alive and it's also ready. And similarly for manager and all these subsystems, and we can just uh, fetch out all these results, check uh, parse all those results, and check okay now it's globally healthy and uh, ready to be deployed uh, to a system. So the mentorship was great experience for me. Like I have these amazing two mentors, uh, Andrew and Evan, with me. We both are uh, creators and maintainers of Spire, if we Spire both. Uh, awesome folks, we used to come regularly on, uh, uh, whenever I had a problem, they would just call me on a Zoom call and we would interact, we would talk about it. We keep a doc to maintain the progress and all these ideas that I have. And we, there was a time conflict of, obviously, we have a, like 12 hour time difference between us, but it wasn't never a hindrance because we, um, uh, we had a perfect system. We had synchronized our timings such that uh, whenever I, I used to just uh, I uh, make some design decisions and just comment it in the docs and they will just comment back like, okay, this is fine. Or what changes can we make? Or if you have any problem, we can uh, get a meeting to it. So these are just awesome folks. Uh, I would like to thank them. Um, and what I learned. So uh, initially, like I didn't know about Spiffy or Spire anyhow. So I was a bit tense when I started because it's a security project, uh, it's an authentication project, and I really uh, didn't have much uh, knowledge about that, diving into it, not the kind of knowledge that is required for such a huge system. But I learned like we can make mistakes and you know um, learn from them. Uh, it's uh, easier said than done uh, because uh, we can make some stupid mistakes and be, uh, Think about like what people will think, but uh, if you have really like good mentors such as uh, such as I had, so you will really enjoy that learning process from mistakes. Uh, so what we did was uh, I make a lot of mistakes during the initial PRs, like small mistakes that should not be made. Uh, but uh, my mentors really helped me. Uh, we went through all these PRs, uh, code reviews, and all that meetings. If I was lagging in some concepts or something. And doing that slowly over time, these error numbers got reduced, and finally I was able to create good uh, PRs without any conflicts and all. So regular feedback with mentors uh, helps, really helps. We, uh, with, not with mentors, with the entire community, whichever you are part of. You just have to interact, and you will surely get an answer. So I can give a quick example of what mistakes means. So, uh, so this is kind of... Uh, thing, uh, it was an issue in Golang that I found during uh, when I, while I was working on a PR. Uh, I thought like it was really a stupid mistake. Uh, I should figure out before uh, submitting this PR. And it turns out that it was a problem with uh, Go uh, rather than uh, the PR. So, you know, you, you start making P, uh, mistakes, you try to find them. Uh, and along the way, you might find something valuable like I did. So this is like the issue I found out. Uh, I uh, I went on to Go Slack, Go Lang Slack uh, channel, and these two incredible guys helped me to figure out that it was a Stack Overflow error in uh, Go, please, and not an issue with my code. So you should you should uh, you should never be shy shy away to ask for help. You you know you if you ask and you will find. That's it. Uh, communication is key. Just interact with the community talk to them, uh, it will be fine. It, so yeah, and the getaway part was, getaway part is not like you should just get away from the mistakes, but rather than pretty uh, figuring it out before you know things started to mess up. So for example, in my previous case, I uh, almost rigged the system, but uh, talking to them, uh, talking to the community, talking to people, interacting with them, find, uh, help, reaching out for help, uh, finally helped uh, in uh, finding the solution before I uh, merged the PR, which was like the getaway part for me because no one find like I did it, but now they do. 
So yeah, this was the getaway part. You should figure it out, but you should never be uh, shy away from asking for help. And the, uh, the most important thing everyone knows is to just have a great time. It's a really great experience. You will meet a lot of people, uh, make a lot of friends, uh, and a lot of new acquaintances, which we meet in person someday. Um, so yeah, have a great time. Uh, don't shy away from asking from anything, be a part of the community, interact with people and yeah, have a great time in general. So if you have any questions, I'll be in chat and you can ask me, thanks. Thanks everybody for speaking. Graduates, congratulations. You have done a great job. Um, loved listening to all of your experiences. It's been, uh, um, this is why we do what we do, um, providing all these resources. And it's uh, fulfilling for us to see you use these resources and uh, that it makes a difference to you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, uh, final note, we are, I'm going to thank my sponsors, uh, Red Hat, GitHub, Intel, and IBM. They have been uh, supporting this program since uh, day one, three, three years ago. So um, thanks everybody and good night on this side of the globe and good day to you on the other side of the globe. Thank you. <laughs>